Good evening, good evening, happy Sunday, uh, happy Mother's Day. We are so glad to be here today. It's, it's just an amazing thing and such an honor to be on this platform today, the Lapid Light Torch Hour. And today with me, I have coach, associate pastor, business um, specialist. You, you do so much in business. I don't even know what title to put it onto. Uh, but we have this amazing all-round leader um, and very inspired speaker, uh, David Jenny, very talented um, in front of people and behind the scenes. Uh, and I'm so thankful to have him here today. So we're, we're having a conversation today about fatherhood, about coaching, about mentorship, and where all this come together, where they meet, is it the same thing? Is it different? How do we engage with it? And as we get into that, I'd just like to allow um, David to introduce himself and perhaps why he thinks uh, I thought of him when I thought of having this conversation. Why would you put would me you on this exactly? Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really honored and uh, privileged to be here. Um, um, I think it's being in a good place where the people that call the shots are your friends. Uh, part of this conversation at the Lapid uh, Torch Hour. So myself, about me, um, yeah, so really glad to be here as part of the Torch Hour, really honored and privileged. I think it's that place when um, your, <laughs> your friends are the ones calling the shots. Huh? So, um, wow, about me. So I'm a, I recently adjusted my introduction to I'm a destiny enabler, because when I look at all the things I do, I think they bring... The, that's the best way to capture or embody everything that I do. So the reason I went into coaching, the reason I went into training, the reason I'm so passionate about business is because I believe these are the tools that God has given us to, to impact or to make a difference on this planet and to, to really just stamp our presence and make impact in different lives. Um, I believe business is one of those things that we can use to elevate poverty uh, among, among, among our people. And having been so passionate about business and revenue generation, um, that because people are at the core of everything. So my organization, Opportunity Consulting Limited, really focuses on three key areas. So we, we call ourselves business development consultants, but it focuses on three key areas. Sustainable revenue generation and management. If you're raising revenue, but your the raising of your revenue is not sustainable, you're going to be in trouble. Your business will not last long. Then we went to the next level, system development and implementation. For anything to grow and be sustainable, there must be systems and processes in place. And then the third part is human capital development. It doesn't matter whether you're generating great revenue. It doesn't matter whether your systems are great. If your people are not aligned, if your people do not feel sufficiently equipped, then you're in trouble. So those are the key areas that I focus on. So I'm a certified professional coach. I'm a Noble Manhattan coach. Um, um, I'm a gold coach with the Noble Manhattan uh, Coaching of the UK um, as part of what I do with the Alpha Group. I am also a regional director working with businesses in peer-to-peer -peer advisory, um, peer -peer advisory conversations where we bring business leaders together and just have conversations about how to move their businesses and specifically double the value of the businesses in two years. More than that, I a financial growth coach. I'm a couples and money coach. Uh, so you can hear the money and how many times it comes up uh, mm. because I'm really passionate about this. Yeah, really about, about people. So I believe I'm in this space to help people become the best versions of themselves. I love that. And you've actually spoken about the intersection point, um, which I felt that you'd be the best person to have this conversation with. And that intersection point is human capital development. 
And um, I feel that for a very long time, there's a disconnect which is now being challenged. There's a disconnect between the marketplace and um, you should say the social spaces, the social economic spaces at home, at church and all those places. And the disconnect has been people think that when you get to work, you're a different person from who you are outside of the workplace. And therefore, uh, you are a person is taken sort of like without their personhood. Um, yet the person that you have in work is fully informed by what happens and, and what occurs and what has shaped that person outside the workplace. And I personally, I don't know why, because I'm not trained in human uh, resource management and that kind of thing. But in every place that I've been, I have a heart for the people because it's very clear that when the people feel heard, feel understood, when the people are aligned um, with the goals and objectives of the organization, then the business is that much easier. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot less drama um, and it's a yeah. people thing. Yeah, so uh, uh, that, that disconnect is being challenged by our favorite generation. I don't even know whether they're generation X, Z, whatever, alpha, I don't know <laughs> what we're calling them. <laughs> but our separation is being challenged. We just flow with it. <laughs> we just flow with it. Yeah. So that separation is being challenged because we are realizing we're having people coming to the workplace and they're having unique challenges that if at the workplace it's not dealt with, then you have a problem with your business output. But then the question that I've heard some HR people asking is, is this yeah. our purview of influence? How do we tell someone his addiction behaviors are a problem? How do we tell someone that their attachment styles are a problem? So yeah. there's a forced overlap of what is traditionally called parenting and people yes. managing, you know? Mm. And, and, and thus we get into this place mm. We we're talking about fatherhood. So from your yes. experience, from what you know, how would you define what fatherhood is? Wow, a very interesting conversation, Titi. And um, you know, just listening to what you say, it's a conversation that I've been having with myself and uh, we've been having in different spaces. We've had it in church, um, in Mavuno Church, we've had it in different spaces, different environments. And it's so interesting that you mention it because it's embodied in how Lapid or the, the, the key approach, the way Lapid addresses the issue of leadership in Africa. I'm a student of leadership, I'm a student of business. And among the things that have been of keen interest for me or that have come to the fore for me are the fact that a leader must first lead self. And so when you look at the way um, Lapid leaders take progresses the conversation, we start with leader, lead, leadership of self, we then go to leadership of marketplace, and then we go to leadership of Africa. And this has become a real reality for me that in this season, I'm still grappling with leadership of self issues that had not been dealt with in the past. Now, I, I had the privilege of work of uh, serving under uh, a wonderful woman that you know as well, um, uh, Apostle Angie Moreng, yes. uh, who's the author of this book, The Purpose and Leadership Forum, uh, where, where it's the first time I had this conversation on fatherhood uh, being had um, with, her, with, her, um, with her YouTube channel, Just Angie. And one of the things that I learned in that space. She kept talking to me when, when I was going through this um, journey. David, character, 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 dealing with pride, character. And I, I didn't get it. I couldn't get it. For a very long time, I couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. And as I've submitted myself to that leadership journey and I went through I've gone through different leadership programs one of them is uh, fearless institute with um, with Mavuna church I serve in Lapid leaders um, as one of the mentors and, uh, and coaches I mean um, listening to this conversation there's definitely need to get to the bottom of it and I think Lapid leaders completely nailed it mm. leadership of self mm. until you can lead self you cannot effectively lead marketplace or lead Africa or lead the world. 
So many times we've tried to do it the other way. And, and part of it is for lack of knowledge. And uh, I'm a student of the John Maxwell team. I'm just working towards my certification uh, for the John Maxwell uh, team. And one of the things I'm learning is just the importance of developing leadership character. Everybody can quickly gain the benefits of leadership skills, which are very top level. And when you look at an, at an iceberg, mm -hmm. what you see on top is just 10%. 90% of it is below. And so what we see on top in the leadership iceberg is just the 10% that is the leadership skill. Mm -hmm. But the leadership character, which then drives your decisions in moments of crisis, which then drives your, your temperament when, when, when faced in a, with a conflict situation, which drives your emotional um, intelligence, which drives the way you take care of people, which drives the way you plan people's mm -hmm. growth. All that 90% mm -hmm. is underwater. We don't see that. And sadly, many times that is what is not developed. And so as we're having this conversation of fatherhood, um, that's, that's foundational. That's key for us to think about what mm -hmm. does leadership uh, look like. And one of the things that has come to my attention, one of the things I first had mentioned in the purpose and leadership space is that leadership is fatherhood. And so we, we've many times we wondered, is it a chicken and egg situation? Which one comes first? Do we first become leaders so that we can become fathers? Or are we first fathered, then we can become leaders? And this is a conversation that we can go on for a while. So my question to you, Tindy, is how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have just enough time to get the basics and keep running. Hmm? But I like what you're saying. Fatherhood yeah. is leadership. And it's so funny, there's something about um, this leadership space and father. time. Leadership is fatherhood. And there's something interesting about this time because these conversations are going on in very, very many different spaces. And one of the different spaces where we recently had this conversation is within, again, you, you showed us a manual, so I'm just taking permission from that, um, of the space where you first had about fatherhood. So um, yes. one of the conversations we had recently in that a purpose and leadership forum uh, platform uh, was about fatherhood. And the person who was speaking um, on that day um, shared something, a very interesting perspective on, on, on what fatherhood is. Um, fatherhood is yes. about being aligned to the source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and uh, seeing that we are believers and we believe yes. in God through Jesus, the son, by the power yes. and the spirit, the Holy Spirit, um, then we see God as the source of all things. And then fathers yes. and yes. leaders then come directly under that and co-create yes. with God a situation, an environment, a place that allows others to thrive. Yeah. Um, and by what? By providing uh, safety, by, by providing shelter, by providing food, by providing counsel, uh, by providing yeah. a cover. Um, and, and therefore then the source provides, then the co-created partner in the providing then is the leader, is the father. And here we're not talking about male or female, that is not a variable. It's the position, it's the title. Uh, and, and then therefore then we can look at leadership uh, if we are saying that uh, leadership is fatherhood, fatherhood is leadership, yes. then we can look at leadership about what it takes to create an environment for others to thrive. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, sorry, sorry. Carry on. no, 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 go, go, go. You're the expert. Me, I'm just picking from stories <laughs> over here. <laughs> My apologies. There was, there was, I think there was a beep in the, in the, in the, in the network. And then I thought you had finished. So I, I came out only to realize, oops, she's still speaking. So thank you for that. And um, again, uh, maybe just to realize happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, to you, TV, and to all the mothers um, in the room, uh, uh, both current and aspiring. Um, <laughs> as a daughter of Eve, you're called to motherhood. So um, happy Mother's Day to all of you. And to all those that are desiring to be mothers, may the Lord answer your prayers um, to be actual, actual biological mothers. May the Lord answer your prayer. But even as we discuss this conversation of fatherhood, um, may you also see how your role fits mm -hmm. in because it's very critical in this time. Good point. Now, Good. you're right in saying, Tindy, that um, 
that the fatherhood conversation is becoming a real thing. And one, my, one of my friends with whom we were with in class, um, uh, Bernard Atonga, uh, wrote this book, uh, Fatherhood, Impacting the Family and Transforming the Society. And it's one of those books that I found, it really unpacks that conversation because we've we led one of those sessions together. We've talked about those sessions together and he unpacks that conversation quite a bit. It tells you the conversation is going on. Um, another friend of mine and who's also currently aspiring for governor for Makweni, um, Pastor Simon Berg has also written a book, Dad is Destiny. And it's also one of those books I would recommend if you're looking. And it talks about a difference a father makes. Um, oh, then I did mention I'm also an author of a book, Unveiled and Unshackled, just talking about breaking the chains that keep you from launching out. Now, this conversation is critical, Tindy. And for us, I think, to have this conversation properly, it's important to understand why this conversation is critical. Mm -hmm. And one of the things um, I learned a while back in one of my the leadership programs I was a part of was before you can start to come up with a solution, you must get to, a, to the bottom of the problem. Begin by understanding what problem are we trying to solve? It's mm -hmm. critical to business, every business Mm -hmm. exists and thrives because it's solving a problem. Um, it's the reason you're hired in an organization because P these people are having a certain problem and you're coming to fix it. So if you mm -hmm. do not understand the problem, then you cannot be an answer to the problem. And mm -hmm. if you're not an answer to the problem, then you are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that's critical to the conversation we're having, whether it's about church, uh, whether it's about people going to church, whether it's about um, the marketplace, whether it's about mm -hmm. problems Africa is facing, we must uh, see the underlying issue. And the underlying issue here is around identity. Because identity defines behavior, identity defines habits, identity defines obedience, and identity defines responsibility. Mm. Tini, when you're, when you're parent calls you, whether they call you kindly or unkindly, in a crowd of people, who will respond to that call? The mm -hmm. children who are called by the name of the parent that has mm -hmm. called out. If you are not identified or you do not identify with that voice, with that name, you mm -hmm. will not respond. Mm -hmm. And the Part of the problem with leadership is that there are people in positions that identify with their voice. And one of the things that Jesus talks about is that my sheep hear my voice. Mm -hmm. For you to be an effective leader, you must mm -hmm. identify who your mm -hmm. people are and you must gain or earn the right to lead them. They must want to follow you intentionally. And that is when leadership shifts, because at that point, they then begin to embody who you are. And it speaks into various things that we hear, that a leader determines the tone of the people they lead. They determine the tone of the organization. They determine the tone. And so you realize that this thing is important. Why do they determine the tone? And when we talk about fatherhood, um, in different spaces. And uh, we recently had um, a sermon mm -hmm. series at, at our church, uh, at Mavuno mm -hmm. Church, on reflections of the Father. And it really tackled this issue of my identity. And Pastor Mills was driving the main, Pastor Mills was driving the main agenda of this conversation. And you can find it online, Reflections of the Father, really broke down what fatherhood is. But to understand the importance of fatherhood, you must first understand the, uh, the importance, the, the, the problem that fatherhood comes to answer. And that's the problem of orphan spirit or of mm -hmm. orphanhood. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. orphanhood is not just the loss, the, lo the lack of parents. Of course, the physical, biological orphan is when you don't have parents. Your parents have all passed on. Mm -hmm. But orphanhood is actually lack of fatherhood, that you have no one with whom to identify. It's loss of identity. And that is the foundation. So fatherhood is about passing on genes, whether these are spiritual or they are solical, uh, 
in the professional space, in the biological space, fatherhood is about passing on genes. One of mm. the definitions that we, we look at is that a father, um, oops, so I'm seeing, okay, great, that's better. My device was starting to slow down, I was wondering. Yeah. So um, fatherhood comes to answer identity mm -hmm. conversation. Fatherhood comes to answer mm -hmm. orphan spirit. Fatherhood comes to fix the lens. Or oh, let me let me change that. Correct mm -hmm. fatherhood comes to fix the lens that we have from damaged, where, uh, from damaging father wounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And fatherhood comes to fix the issues of responsibility. And father is a source of DNA, which is the encoding. So they are a source. Generations start from a father. Mm -hmm. um, fatherhood, a father is a is a sustainer. So fatherhood brings us. Um, we we get sustenance from our fatherhood. Mm -hmm. A father, a father is a supporter. They carry tradition, and that's why it's mm -hmm. very important to trace your father, your lineage, mm -hmm. because it speaks into the way into their certain things that can fix you. That if you do not sort with your fatherhood, um, or if you do not understand, you can be struggling in life, not knowing that it's actually your father foundations. Mm. And that's why fatherhood is critical. It's critical, yeah. So leaders must society as being a factor of the breakdown of fatherhood. Mm. then you as a leader need to see your people as people needing a source, mm. whether a source of provision or a source of guidance or a source mm. of wisdom, people mm -hmm. needing uh, protection, people needing all those things that have been destroyed by broken down fatherhood. And mm. that is the foundation. All these things you're mentioning in broken down society, is because of the orphan spirit. In pursuit of independence, mm -hmm. we have lost that connection to the Father. And so we are unable even to relate with God properly because mm -hmm. the model is And anytime the model or the blueprint mm -hmm. is wrong, we are in trouble. Try mm -hmm. building anything with a wrong blueprint and you're in trouble. So leadership, mm -hmm. right leadership needs to begin to restore that fatherhood and then this so this calls for a very different approach to leading people mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. have to see our role mm -hmm. as leaders we have to see our role as leaders as correcting model correcting the blueprint correct let me pause there for a moment to allow you You've said heavy in. things. You've dropped heavy things. Um, for those of you listening, this is a conversation around leadership. This is a conversation we are looking at the workplace. We are looking at the socioeconomic situation that leads us into the different, um, I don't want to, to use crisis, but the, it's like a crisis under the water. It is, it is a crisis. It, has, it is a crisis. <laughs> it is a real yeah. crisis. Yeah, you know. Um, but it's also, there's never been a time so ripe to have these hard conversations and to start to ask ourselves, where have I gotten my model of leadership? Where, where, why do I look at the people who I am responsible for? Why do I look at them the way I do? When, when I look at my children, what do I carry from my relationship with my children into the workplace? And when I look at the workplace, what do I carry from that place um, into, in, into, into the home? Because uh, the reality is we are one person and your whole personhood moves from these different spaces. Yeah. So now that we have established the foundation of just a little bit, like literally this is the tip of the iceberg of what fatherhood is and that we have established that where we are now, when we're thinking about leadership, we are facing the challenge of correcting broken patterns and blueprints of fatherhood and of leadership. Um, but what does that begin to take? So 
put a tag on that question as I move on to the next question. And okay. the next question then is around, we are seeing a rise of coaches. Every year suddenly, oh coach, oh coach, what is a coach? <laughs> what is the whole coach thing? And is it the same thing as mentorhood? As I said, put a, put a, a tag on that fatherhood conversation because we're coming back. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is a coach? What is a mentor? How does that even begin to interact with this blueprint of leadership situation? So thank you, thank you so much for that, Tibi. And I'll try not to get very technical with the division between uh, coaching and mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, before I forget, um, there are two books that I've read that have um, um, father cemented this understanding about the role of a leader as a coach and a mentor. And one is the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. And the other one is um, The Heart of Leadership by Mark Miller. So as we're talking about coaching, mm -hmm. um, let me first help us understand about coaching. We are talking about, and of course, there's the traditional sense of a coach who who gives instruction and tells people what to do, and if they follow what they, what is being done, then mm -hmm. they get the right results. Now, mm -hmm. um. Looking at coaching to help them achieve their personal and professional goals. So the, the, the definition according to the um, definition according to the International Coach Federation is that coaching is mm -hmm. partnering with someone in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. And really it's about taking time to understand this person and where it is they want to go. And then using that to move them, help move to the next level. Mm -hmm. For me to further explain what coaching is and to differentiate it from uh, mentorship, let me explain mentorship from the action part of it. Now, when you're talking about mentorship, if I was mentoring you, Tindy, mm -hmm. what you'd be saying is that, David, I like the results that you've achieved in life. Mm -hmm. I like what I see. When I look at your life, I like what I see. But I like your mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. I want your results. And I'm ready to do everything you've done to achieve these results. Okay? And you as a mentor, me as a mentor, then say, all right, Tindy, I am willing to walk with you to teach you everything I have done. And if you follow these to the T, you will get the results I have gotten. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that is mentorship. So when I am your mentor, you are my mentor. It means I am following the footsteps mm -hmm. that you have. It's very much like discipleship because discipleship takes it even further. Because <laughs> then discipleship con con combines the mentoring, the coaching, the training. But basically, is that everything I have taught you or everything I have done, actually, it's everything I have done, I will teach you and you will do to get the results I've gotten. Now, what okay, does so the mentorship up. take? Yeah. Yes. Well, hold up. Can you go to? Just a little bit. Um, I don't want us to rush too yes. fast over this. Because what then I'm hearing is, that mentorship is literally downloading a blueprint. Like this is how you have done it. And this is yes. your blueprint and you're passing on that blueprint to your mentee. So exactly. we've got it, higher exactly. passive. This, is what, just... this is what has worked for me. Mm -hmm. If you follow this to the letter, mm. we will be fine. Mm. but it focuses on what I have done. So mm. for you to choose me as a mentor, I must have succeeded in the areas that you want to succeed. 
And that's something many times when we're talking about mentorship, mentorship, we don't take into account. That when I'm picking a mentor, I'm saying, this results you've achieved, I want them. Mm. And I'm willing to do everything you have done. And many times, even the mentors do not know that mentorship is from a point of what I have succeeded in. The mm. things that work for me. Mm. This is the path I used. And sometimes I will also say, um, I'll, of course, I'll be able to tell you, hey, I passed there, but mm. it didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Okay? I, mm-hmm. I used that route and it didn't work. So a mentor will be able to say, this is what I did. They can only speak from their experience. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see it. I see. It's a very personal, it's a very subjective um, relationship. That's exactly. what I see. Exactly. And part uh-huh. of the failure in mentorship is that uh-huh. the mentor doesn't understand their role mm. and the mentee doesn't understand their responsibility. So there's a role and there's so a responsibility. With roles and responsibility, but it's the same, the same thing. So role and responsibility, exactly. The moment you've taken the position of a mentor, there are certain expectations from you. And the mm. moment you've taken your position as a mentee, there's certain mm-hmm. expectations of you. So it's not just the about coffee dates. I will teach you everything. I know. <laughs> no, it's not just about coffee dates. I'll teach you everything I know. I'll download everything I know, everything I've done. Mm. And what has worked, I'll be able to also tell you what hasn't worked. So I'll be pointing you, walk here this way, this works. Do not walk here this way, this works. This doesn't work. So another well. thing I'm hearing, David, another yeah. thing I'm hearing, David, again, just I, I want to go a bit slowly because these are, so, these are deep points. Another thing I'm hearing is that a mentor downloads their their ways, their experience to a mentee. So if we are talking about um, marketplace career mentorship situation, yes. a mentor downloads their genes of success to the mentee. Exactly. And already we are starting to see the connecting points. It's a function. Exactly. It's, exactly. A, it's one face and one function of yes. the larger place of fatherhood. Yes. yes. Interesting. I love it. I love and it. And so when I say Tim is my mentor, mm-hmm. then Tindy must be a success in the space of that I'm looking to succeed. Mm. Or at least at the bare minimum, she must have gone that journey. So as she can tell me, son, I did not succeed in this area. However, I know a few things that Mm. may be useful or helpful to you. Mm. That is the mentor. I then, as the mentee, must also have the responsibility Mm -hmm. to obey everything. And to follow to the letter every single instruction. Yeah, hot words. I cannot choose the ones I will take and ignore. Obey, follow to the T. Even when you're not feeling it, even when you're thinking, I obey. Your mentor has spoken. Take it and run. And you see the correlation? Your father has spoken. You take it and you run. Hey. Because you want to achieve this thing, mm. this is what worked for me, or this is what did not work for me. So if I tell you avoid that, you quickly move away backwards, you don't turn your back on it, move away backwards and go in another direction. Mm. If I tell you this works, that's the route you take. That is mentorship. Mm. And you can begin to see the correlation when a father is leading their son. Is that aspect of modeling. I have modeled. Therefore, mm-hmm. you follow this and you'll see the results I have seen. Yeah. Wow. How does this differentiate with coaching? Yeah. And this is where it becomes very exciting. A while back, I got, and this I think was just a download, around the, a different definition or dif- way to differentiate between management and leadership. Mm -hmm. A manager uses the resources available to them to produce what they've been told these resources can produce. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So if I've been told this is the limit of this resource, 100 bags, I only look for everything we could, but we only got 100 bags. That's mm -hmm. the limit. So a manager ensures we can produce that limit. Mm -hmm. A leader on the other side optimizes the potential of hmm. the resources available to them. A leader looks at the resources available to them and says, you know what? I really, we really don't know what the potential of these resources are, mm -hmm. but we will seek to understand them deeply mm -hmm. and unlock their full potential. Mm -hmm. So the same resources that produce a hundred bags mm -hmm. have the potential of producing up to a thousand under a leader, mm -hmm. while they'll only produce a hundred and below under a manager. Hmm. Kyle, another bomb. Because then what you're saying then is a yeah. manager is not necessarily a leader. Very correct, Timmy. But leaders and we have yes are always managers. Leaders can be managers. Or can be managers, not always. And it's important to understand this. Mm -hmm. can, can be managers. Hmm. And the reason, and it's important to understand this because, mm -hmm. because the leader is seeking to maximize the potential. They need some managers who can then follow through with the systems and processes. Somebody needs to do that. And Michael E. Gaba in his book, The e -Myth, uh -huh. differentiates three levels of people. And he talks about the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the entrepreneur takes more the responsibility. They see the potential. No one has gone this way before, but they see here there can be a highway. Here, there mm. can be so much potential. That's the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But he also talks about the manager. There has to be someone who puts order into things. And sometimes it's impossible to be so vision-oriented, so big picture that you miss mm. Mm. The, 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 you miss to, to see the process that the children need to go through, the process that your team needs to go through to grow to this potential that you're exploring. So the leader needs to have some, or to have some managerial skills or needs to have some managers in their team that then, or needs to quickly identify, ah, there it is, mm -hmm. identify the managers within this team that they have, who will mm -hmm. then be keen on ensuring that we are developing and um, uh, maintaining some key processes that will give us the results that we want to see. My mind is blowing. So look at a father who says, uh -huh. ah, you guys are royalty. You people are kings, you're princes. You're destined mm. for great things. And they push their children, five-year-olds, four-year-olds, two-year-olds, mm. to become these princes, to operate in a certain level of decorum. But they haven't mm. been taught. They haven't been taken through the processes. Yeah. So a manager first sees the big picture. But a leader sees the big picture, but there has to be an aspect of management mm. to navigate from stage one to stage two to stage three. You still keep your eye on the potential, but mm. you're then navigating and leading people. In that space, then there's an aspect of modeling, which is now the mentorship. Mm -hmm. In that space, there's an aspect of coaching, which mm. is then, and then there's also an aspect of training. And mm -hmm. I, it's important that we, we see this in its fullness. We're talking yeah. about leadership, we're talking about fatherhood. Father really embodies quite a number of things because they are a trainer, they are a coach, they are a mentor. And sometimes they even, as, as experts in their space, they're drawing people to that space of, mm -hmm. of finding their own solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what comes in. Okay. For you to be an effective, for you to be, well, well, as a mentor, 
many times there are certain things we don't realize or we don't pay attention to. The, the place where mentorship begins to miss the point or where mentorship begins to, to have some shortcomings is that it doesn't take into account some critical things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're mentoring me, uh, Tim, your personality is not mine. Mm. So coming number one, the mentorship process doesn't take that into account. Mm -hmm. the, the resources you had available to you may not be available to me. Shortcoming number two. Mm. Um, the environment within which you operated is not the same environment I'm operating. Shortcoming number three. And so these things, if I don't take into account these things, when you, when, when, if you don't take into account these things as a mentor, when I begin to struggle with some of the stuff you're asking me to do, conflict, we reach a block. And when mm -hmm. we get to that block, there are certain things I cannot transcend because I'm stuck. Mm. And that's where coaching now comes in. Okay. Because coaching says, in you, there is a diamond. And this process that we are going through, we want to reach out for that diamond and bring it out and polish it and let it shine. So coaching believes as one as my 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 coach my coach coach trainer, Elin um, uh, Laska MCC. She's a master certified coach. Elin Laska would say, "Everyone is a diamond in the rough." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where coaching starts. Mm -hmm. Coaching starts with, "It's okay, wherever you are." but we can work through this. Inside you, there's such great potential. And in mm -hmm. this journey, we are going to unlock that potential. Mm -hmm. And I see the image of Mufasa when his son is being carried in the air. Anyway, when his son is being carried in the air. Yeah. And looking at that little feeble infant, Mm. you don't see a feeble infant you see a king mm -hmm. in the making it's interesting that you choose to use uh, that imagery but yeah it's not a cub but the king in the making it's a king even before the process in the making exactly even before the process and mm. that's where leadership and fatherhood begins Fatherhood mm -hmm. calls out mm -hmm. your identity. Fatherhood calls out your potential. I believe that many people are struggling because they have not been called out. And they have not been called out because as one Apostle Michael Kibingo once said, they have not found their father's voice. And they haven't Ooh. found their father's voice because of this orphan spirit. In pursuit of independence from that feebleness, that weakness, mm. we separated ourselves from potential spaces of fatherhood. Mm. So the people that were trying to call us out, not knowing that they were playing a role of fatherhood, and maybe they were a bit harsh, or maybe we've actually suffered some real father wounds because they did not know what their role as fathers, as leaders, calling out that potential. And they said they were making us strong. They were toughening us up, but they yeah. broke us in the process. But why mm. did they break us in the process? Because they didn't realize that even with that drawing out of our potential, there had to be a process mm. that included nurturing, that included providing for, that included mm. giving me everything I need, creating mm. the environment I need, creating mm. the space for me to grow. Mm. And we see it in the role of a gardener, that for you to have 
good fruit. It doesn't begin by planting good seed. Mm. It begins by preparing the soil. Mm. Preparing the space in which you're going to put your seed. Mm. Sadly, there's a lot of good seed in mm -hmm. bad soil. Bad soil. Or good seed, good soil, bad gardeners, mm. bad leaders, bad mm. or incompetent leaders and incompetent fathers. So one so of I'm the things that, sorry, yeah, so you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm saying um, just before we get to the next uh, space, one of the things that um, I'm starting to appreciate right now is that many times, because it's very easy to fall into that place of saying, look, uh, the fathers have failed. They did wrong, they've broken. The, the leaders have failed, they did wrong, they've broken. But there's always a responsibility on, on you. Yes. You know, uh, your path is not um, set because you did not have a good leader, both in the workplace and at home, your path is not set by the brokenness of that leadership. And one of the things I've learned to appreciate is many times there was simply not, no better blueprint that they had. So when it said that, you know, yes, maybe the father broke you. Yes, maybe your first boss broke you. There's a lot of, you know, people crying out about crazy trauma that they've had at their places of work. Maybe your bosses have broken you. But then when you begin to appreciate that that is the only model that they know and therefore have nothing better to give you, then the responsibility is back on you who feels that you can do better to actively pursue the better. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt I needed to add that yeah. um, so that we do not uh, have our listeners and our audiences, those who are watching now and those who are going to catch up later, get stuck in that loop of, uh, I'm broken because yeah. the people who trained me broke me. Yeah. 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 So now, now we get out of high level. I'd like us to move out of high level. We, we have about yeah. 20, 25 minutes left. Sure. So I'd like us to move out of high level and come down a little bit. We want to know, David, yeah. what led you to coaching? What is your journey? Where are you coming from? How come you're where you are? What gives you the right to say all the things you're saying? Well, so I'll begin by saying, I was listening to, and maybe just to tie up the, the conclusion we're just having, the conversation we're just having, is I was listening to an interview between Oprah and Viola Davis. I don't know if you had it. She's it's just- On my saved list, I'll yeah, get she there. Just released, she just released her new book. Um, and I'm, trying to remember what the title is but she said something that was really profound in that interview she said you can expect stuff from me but have you thought that probably i don't know how to deliver what you're asking me to deliver mm -hmm. so while yes we have to take some responsibility and we need to find our father's voices we need to identify people that are, and, and part of it is through prayer. And if you're not a spiritual person, just being in a space where you can see. And many times we know because we are spiritual beings and mm. we can see spaces where people are thriving or where people seem to be thriving. Mm. Um, another thing is to identify a coach and find a coach that can then walk this journey with you. Because part of that journey of walking with a coach will also help you identify who your father, your, your leader is, the person that you can draw more from. That's why I love mm -hmm. coaching. Now, why did I end up in coaching TV? I started as a very shy person. Can you imagine? <laughs> and you know me personally. I started and your as a, big voice, you were shy. Your big voice was shy. <laughs> it never used to be hard. It used to be subdued and defeated. <laughs> Partly because of that. how partly because of how I grew up and my parents, my dad and mom did a brilliant job with me, uh, but partly because of how I grew up. You know, that age of the children are not for speaking, they're for being seen. Just, uh -huh. yeah. And when you're told something, you do it. And, and just that my self-expression was really subdued when I was growing up. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
And that affected me significantly. So I never used to speak and I would hold back quite a bit. Then I get into the workplace and I'm mm -hmm. struggling. I did seven jobs in my first seven or so years of business. Wow. And I think I've worked for a total of 12 organizations, be, not counting my own, huh? <laughs> in my short career of under 20 years. And I didn't understand why this was happening or what this was about. But in, in, throughout my life, I've been a leader. I say I've been a leader for 43 years, 42 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I was born a leader. I'm a fastborn. Hey, yeah, so there's no more born being a born a leader than anyway, that. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I've been in leadership positions throughout. So imagine being yeah. a leader who, first of all, you're clueless about what's going on. There's all this expectation from you and you're mm -hmm. struggling just convincing yourself that you're supposed to be the person in that position. And mm -hmm. that's where my drama started. But my transition, I believe, began one in class eight, the day I decided I'm not following people anymore. I'm going mm -hmm. to be uh, my own person. And then number two, in my workplace, I was working, mm -hmm. this was probably in my sixth job. Mm -hmm. um, I got into a sales job and I'd always wanted to do a proper sales job. And this was my first freelance sales job Ooh. and I, I remember struggling for nine months i sold zero nothing nothing zero 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 so i earned nothing and the first three months i was earning a retainer mm -hmm. then after three months it ended and for the next six months i earned zero wow. and in month nine my life turned around and why did my life turn around mm -hmm. one of course i believe just god's favor <laughs> <laughs> but number two I found a book or I finally opened a book that I'd had in my possession for five years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by Brian Tracy, Advanced Selling Strategy. I call him one of my mentors and I look forward to meeting him someday. And mm -hmm. this book transformed not only my career, but my life. Mm -hmm. As he spoke about the things he had gone through, how he started at the bottom, how he had struggled, how he moved from job to job, I completely completely identified with him mm. i implemented some of the things he talks about in his book in like the first few pages and my mm -hmm. life began to transform mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i made my first sales night sale nine months after i had been hired my sales proceeded to grow within the next six months from two hundred thousand kenya shillings which is about two thousand mm -hmm. dollars to fifty thousand dollars a month which meant my commissions grew from 20,000 shillings, which is $200, to well over 7,000 um, 7, shillings a month, month on month, for over a year and a half. Wow. And in that time, something switched in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because all around me were people that were people that were in this space where they could earn so much money, but they were struggling. Mm. I remember reaching out to one of my leaders. Could we run trainings for our mm. people and equip people with a skill. Mm. And sometimes, Tindy, our people are struggling just because they don't know how. Mm. And that's mm. the starting point. As a leader, have you trained your people? Mm. Have you equipped them with the skill they need to do the work you've equipped them or you've given to them to do? That's the starting mm. point. Mm. And so um, my job then ends Sometime in early 2013, I find myself in, um, in uh, the purpose and leadership space. Mm -hmm. And my job ending started me on a four-year journey, a three and a half year, four-year journey that then completely transformed my life. Mm -hmm. And in that time, so I got out of this sales space and training just opens up for me. And I did mm -hmm. my first gig in 2015, sitting across from him, I'm saying, you're the guy we've been looking for. He had just landed these big projects and we proceeded to train a thousand sales people in a bank. Whoa. And Whoa. in that year, you know, in the year after, that bank came on top in a year when banks were struggling. Wow. Why? Because of the work we did by the grace of God. And I thank God for that opportunity. Mm. As I was training these people, some of them still people, some of them new to the role, some of them 
branch managers, some of them regional managers, which means mm -hmm. overseeing branches. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of guys are more equipped than I am. You're, you've been at this for long. You've been at this for much longer than I have. How do I mm -hmm. mentor you in this space? I definitely knew I was not the person. Some of them were old enough to have children my age at the time. I was like, how do I mentor you? But you know what? Wow. They said, mentor us. And so I began looking for the answer. What is wow. it out there that can help people turn around? Mm -hmm. So training, I checked in. People were asking me to mentor. I knew I was ill-equipped. Well, part of that was the imposter syndrome. I knew I was ill-equipped to mentor them. But you know what? I found coaching. Or should I say coaching found me? <laughs> mm. Because by the grace of God, um, again, Apostle Lange had gone through this coaching program mm -hmm. and had challenged the leader of the organization to, to offer some coaching. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many people out there that need this that were not in. And the first mm -hmm. time she attempted and she said, and I'm willing to put this to the practice. I'm opening up two slots. Give me two people that you think would be part of this. And mm -hmm. I was one of those two people that mm -hmm. became part of that coaching group. Wow. wow. And that was the start of my coaching journey. Wow. Today, today I've coached people at different levels. Um, I've coached people in school. I've coached students. In the Lapid Leaders Africa, I've coached mm -hmm. Lapidas. I've coached Lapidas. I've coached people in the business space. I've coached mm -hmm. uh, people in the workplace. I've coached mm -hmm. business leaders. I've co mm -hmm. coached um, um, government uh, leaders, people in politics, uh, people in MCAs and MPs through different programs. Mm. Um, I've found myself coaching people in, in other international programs, some of which I can't speak about at this point. Mm -hmm. But God has been faithful and has allowed me to thrive in that space. And he continues to lead me. So my goal is that someday I would coach um, leaders of society. In fact, my goal as a, my vision is to coach leaders of society, presidents, kings, mm. leaders, uh, MPs, governors. Why? Because when these people make one decision, mm. if it's the right decision or the wrong decision, it impacts hundreds of thousands. Mm. It impacts millions of people. Mm. So that is what I want to do, to help these people make the right decisions with the power of coaching to see them come up with decisions that will transform Africa mm. and transform the world by extension. So this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I love to do. So that's, my, that's been my coaching journey. And so what I'm hearing, allow me. I'm heading there quickly. One of my current coaches is a one, one of my current coaches is uh, an advisor to a president. So uh, we are getting there. You're getting there. Actually, now that's what I was going to, to, to sort of like speak into because what I'm hearing from you is when you found your voice. Yeah. Because you started by saying you were very shy. When you found your voice, you have been enabled, you've gone through a process that now you're being able to impart that voice to yeah. so many other people, to allow them to find their own voices as yes. well. And that in essence, again, brings up where we started, which is that place of not just fatherhood, but beginning perhaps to redraw the blueprint uh, from which we're getting our leadership instructions from. To begin to heal that yeah. place, not just of fatherhood, but even of leadership in the business space, in the spaces of governance, yeah. and in the spaces of the church. Nimepata. Oh, David, I think you're freezing. Yes. Ah, there you are. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, good stuff. And, yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. I think you froze a little bit. Sorry about but, that. No problem. Um, so at this point, I'd just like to mention that um, we're making or we're preparing a, a, a conversation to our parents and to our marketplace stakeholders, a conversation at the end of this week that we're getting into that is talking into what it means to 
transparent um, young people for a changing world. And I'm glad that we started this conversation with you, David. And we hope that it will snowball yes. into a conversation that we can start to see ourselves, not just as mothers and fathers and yeah. managers and CEOs and all those nice titles, but begin to see ourselves as responsible for rewriting the story on leadership in the places that we are. Yes, yes. And that starts with acknowledging that perhaps we are carrying a wrong blueprint. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing to acknowledge it. It's a good thing. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'm being very vocal about. That it begins by understanding maybe the the blueprint I have is wrong, mm. and beginning to open ourselves up to learning. Um, and part of that is in coaching conversations, just realizing, hey, you know what? I'm broken too, and I need fixing. Mm. And then mm. finding our father's voices, finding the people that we can be mentored under, or even just finding training, <laughs> equipping ourselves on mm -hmm. how to rewrite the blueprint. An architect must first go to school before they can fix the blueprints uh, that are wrong in, in the building industry. Mm -hmm. Similarly, as leaders, as fathers, we need to equip ourselves. And that's part of the reason I'm going through the John Maxwell program, to mm -hmm. be a more uh, authoritative, but also a more deliberate player in helping people fix that. Because mm. many of us have found ourselves in leadership, literally. Mm. Sadly, we continue to be promoted to different and higher levels of leadership without ever being equipped with the mm. right skills. Mm. So, Big, the, the starting point would be to constantly open ourselves to those spaces of learning. What does it mean to be a good parent? Mm. What does it mean to be a good leader? What does it mm. mean to be a good father? What does this leadership conversation mean? Mm -hmm. What is my role as a leader? What is my role as a father? What is my role as a parent? Starting there, and there's lots mm. of books like the ones I've shared, just unpacking mm. those conversations. Um, there's a lot of uh, YouTube channels now. There's a lot of um, podcasts, uh, I mean, live conversations like this one mm. that, are have, that are beginning this conversation. And that's the starting point. And sometimes the starting point is just knowing, okay, there's a problem. And even in a coaching conversation, would accept that as progress. You've identified there's a problem. That's the starting point. And I mm. think for many leaders or many people in positions of authority, the starting point is identifying that there's a problem. Number mm. two is saying or taking the responsibility to fix that problem. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and Mark Miller talked about the heart leadership. Um, and maybe let me see if I can just pull that up very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Miller talks about heart of leadership. And in the heart of leadership, uh, some of the things he talks about are, it begins by realizing that leadership is not about me. Mm. Yes, I'm a leader. Leadership mm -hmm. is not about me. Mm -hmm. It begins by thinking of others first. Mm. Okay, so I must think of others first. I must realize that my role as a leader is to first identify mm -hmm. the potential in those around me. Okay, so that's the starting. So leadership is, is, is not about me. So I must first identify the potential of the people around me. So the only way I can identify the potential of the people around me is realizing that I must think of others first. It's about them, not about me. Mm. Next thing um talks about is, um, oh, why, why is it disappearing? Why is it disappearing? Why is it disappearing? Uh, the next thing he talks about uh, the heart of a leader. Oh man, it was right here. Mm -hmm. But it talks about equipping others. Okay. So you need to equip them, you need to train them, you need to give information, you need to propose for them places to go and learn and understand their capacities and their powers. 
Anyway, I'll find it. Basically, that's the starting point, that you must first embrace the heart of leadership, knowing that I, by myself, cannot, uh, it's not about me, it's about other people. Oh, it's about other people. Right yeah. Okay. So that's the essence of servant leadership. Think of others yes. first. Um, thinking of others first allows you to invest in them, to seek to spend time with them, mm -hmm. seek to know them better. I cannot invest in you, Timmy, if I don't know you. Mm -hmm. I must first know what are your passions? What are you, what are you, what, are, what is your vision for this life? And if you have, mm -hmm. if you don't have one, help you come up with one. In Lapid Leaders, one of the things we do is we talk about leadership of self. And leadership of self is about helping people come up with a uh, um, vision for or a vision statement for themselves. Just give them a sense of direction about mm -hmm. where they are going. So that's the first thing. So I'm constantly looking to help others. And uh, John Maxwell talks about the law of addition. Uh, the only way I can add value to you is if I begin by understanding where is it you want to go so that whatever I'm giving you is helping you. What do you mm -hmm. need to succeed? Do you even want to be here? Do you even want mm -hmm. to be in this organization? Do you want mm -hmm. to be in this role? Is this mm -hmm. what you where you want to be? So that's the starting point. And then, of course, the law of connection. For me to be able to add value to, to you, I must first know you. Mm -hmm know you very well the second part about leadership is expecting the best the heart of leadership expect the best uh, many times there's such low expectations they're like ah yo, Tavesa, you won't be able to do that ah you give up on it that's too difficult for you and i've had to stop myself i've had to shut my mouth when i'm mm. about to say something uh, demeaning or something limiting to myself but mm. especially to my children mm. so i allow my children to fail I allow them to try something and fail and then mm. use that failure as a starting point. I'm allowing my, mm. my team members to fail. I'll give them responsibility and allow them to fail um, even after I've trained them um, mm. and, and, and expose them to certain things that I need them to do. So expect the best thing because the future has not yet been written, it's written by leaders. So mm. as leaders, part of that expectation uh, or calling out people is to look deep into these people and sometimes you're calling out even something you're like why we don't know whether this is gonna happen but hey mm -hmm. you're great you're made for greatness and we speak those things into them and part of the things i think leaders mm -hmm. of this continent or we as believers or we as people uh, who are passionate about leadership in africa we need to mm -hmm. start saying that africa you are great Africa, you can rule the world. Africa, you can actually be the full, the giant that we've said you are. You're no longer a sleeping giant, you're a giant. Mm. And then we are going to do whatever it takes to make Africa that giant. That's mm -hmm. number two, expect the best. Number three, respond with courage. Leaders mm -hmm. need to respond with courage. Mm -hmm. We need to help our people and teach our people to respond with courage. Part of the reason I think there's a lot of weakness is that many leaders won't go for big things. We won't set mm -hmm. big audacious visions, big audacious goals. We set mm -hmm. goals that we can meet because of our own sense of feelings of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. So we don't expect bigger things from our people. We expect just enough. And that is costing our society. That is costing our people. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then just not waiting to, to, to being reactive. We also need to be proactive. One of the things that we speak about uh, very bold boldly in the lapid leader space uh, so leaders don't wait they initiate that is the rest, uh, responding with courage whenever there's a situation that's not working let's respond uh we are saying that there's this challenge uh among our youth let's not just resign to the mm. situation let's respond let's take a response and sometimes that responding is finding sources of solution number four mm. hunger for wisdom as leaders, we need to hunger for wisdom at whatever level, as parents, as first ones, first ones, as, yeah. as leaders in, in teams, as leaders in organizations, we need to hunger for wisdom. And uh, John Maxwell talks about the leadership lead, the leaders, the law of lead, the law of the lead, sorry. The capacity lead determines your leadership level. Where you've reached is holding back your people. You've created a ceiling. And sometimes you say, no, I'm not keeping anyone down. But if you haven't grown beyond a certain level, your people can't grow beyond a certain level. They don't know there's anything above that level. 
And that is one of the greatest shortcomings of society. We've not opened our minds. We've refused to travel. We've refused to read more. We've refused to expose ourselves. And where we can't travel physically, have we allowed our minds to travel to those places? Mm. A scripture says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or imagine. Sometimes the limit of our thriving is our, the limit of our leadership. Mm. We've mm. reached a certain place and we've gotten stuck. And so we've held back everyone. There's mm. one great organization that receives a lot of great funding, but that organization still looks like a, an upcountry hospital because the leaders of that organization operate, still have that upcountry mindset. And mm. so it's limited the growth of that organization. Mm. And one of their subsidiaries has broken away and they continues to thrive. They are side by side to each other, but yeah. one is an international level organization. Another one is an upcountry hospital with good funding and great doctors. Why? Mm -hmm. The love of the lead. The leadership lead. Hunger for wisdom. Seek to know more. And where you haven't traveled physically, let your mind travel. Read. And number five, leaders accept responsibility. Yeah. And the title there is No Excuses. As a leader, don't give excuses. Accept responsibility. And sometimes accepting responsibility is not necessarily just saying we accept responsibility, but beginning to do something within your little sphere of influence. Um, Kenya is going into elections this year. Many of us are saying, let's wait and see. Instead of waiting and seeing, how about you teach your children about leadership? How about you teach the five people you have influence over? And it said that we are the SI unit of the five people we hang around. You have influence over those five people, especially if in among those five people, you're the king. Those five people, how about you begin to inculcate in them, take the responsibility to inculcate in them uh, um, leadership responsibility. Take responsibility and speak to them what it means to be real leaders. So that's the heart of leadership by Mark Miller. He talks about those five things. I would say that's where to start. Mm. Thank you so much, um, David, for sharing your heart because you have shared your heart. And I feel very privileged to know you because you carry the heart of a father in everything that you do. Just get into a room and people will suddenly start feeling safe. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I associate as You have been in the military at some point. <laughs> anyway, you've been in the military. In another life, in another life, I would have been in the military or the um, the the disciplined forces, one of those. But hey, you see, yeah, we associate we are. fatherhood with discipline. So it's 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 tracking, it's tracking. Um, but thank you. And it's such an honor to have this conversation with you. And as you've rightly put it and see that through the conversation, this is the space in which Lapid Leaders is, is sitting at, and specifically with our young people who are entering the marketplace. At that place where they're transitioning from being trained exclusively at home and in college and getting into the marketplace. And, and, and the heart of Lapid really is around coaching, it's about mentorship, it's about empowering young people with the now skills that they need excel in the marketplace and in the continent of Africa and being open to more, just more, whatever that more is. And it's such a privilege to have this conversation in this space. And I know that we'll be seeing more of you. And for those of you who've caught this conversation on time, thank you. Find me on the site chat. We will talk about this. We will even talk about what we're doing later in this week, which is having another conversation, another webinar situation um, for our parents, for the parents who have uh, young people who've gone through LAPID, for marketplace leaders who are struggling with this conversation about how to engage these young people in a world that just doesn't seem to look the same yesterday then today and we don't even know what to expect tomorrow there is a way there are those who have gone before us there are those holding the door karibuni sana find you in our inbox you're very responsive asante david <laughs> asante sana Tindi. thank you so much for this opportunity and i'm greatly honored to be part of this conversation looking forward to many more asante there we have it good bye. people bye